name is Pastor Jed. I am so thankful to get to worship and follow our Lord Jesus alongside you in your house church today. If this is your first time joining us, or if this is your first time being part of a house church, I want to say welcome. This may look different than anything you've ever experienced before, but we are committed to following the Lord and doing our best to be obedient to what He is showing us. It's less about having a killer sermon and a great worship set, and it's more about us loving each other well, loving Jesus well, praying together well, and studying the scriptures well, and being so captivated by him that we can't keep it in. And that is when our gatherings become a collection of praising King Jesus together because of how we've been spending time with him. I'm so thankful that you are here and that we get to do this together. I shared some stats last week about the next two generations that are coming up and mainly about the trend of how they are going farther from the Lord and his word. And it's heartbreaking family that if they don't know his word, how will they know who he is? And so family, this is an opportunity. This opportunity, it stirred our hearts to want to provide Bibles for every child that is part of this community. And our hope is that every child will have and know the Word of God. That those who God has placed right here in our care, in our homes, around our tables, around in our, in our neighborhoods, in our community, that they wouldn't have to wonder who they are, where they come from, or where they wind up one day. They will know because of His Word that His promise is good, that He alone is God, that He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, and He remains faithful forever. Amen. And now we need your help. So if you have a child in your home, newborn to 18, we want to provide them with a Bible of their very own. Maybe you bring a family member or a friend or a neighbor to your house church. If they're under the age of 18, we want to provide them with a Bible of their very own. Would you let us know? If that's you, would you let us know by sending us an email to start at miamivalley.org. That's start at miamivalley.org. It's going to be at the bottom with the number of kids in each of their ages. That's a simple email to start at miamivalley.org with the number of kids and each of their ages. Family, look at the opportunity that God has given us. Remember, it has to start right here in our hearts, go into our homes, into our neighborhoods, and beyond. Let me pray for us today. Almighty God, Lord, you are holy. You are set apart. Lord, you are unlike any other, and we just bow before you in reverence. As the angels right now, as all of heaven is singing, holy, holy, holy. Lord, we're just humbled to get to be here before you. Lord, that you invite us to come closer. Lord, that you give us your word. Lord, that you just make it so clear that you are not the author of confusion, God, but you speak with clarity. And Lord, you reveal who you are. You alone are God. You love us so much that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to take on our sin, to die in our place, so that we could have life. And Lord, we can't keep that in. We want to tell everyone about it. And Lord, we see, as you've been showing us, that it has to start right here, in our heart, in our home, in our neighborhoods, in our community and go out. And so, Lord, for those who you have put in our care, God, we want to teach them. We want to pass down what has been passed on to us. And so, Lord, I pray over every child that is in this community right here, God, that they would not only receive a physical copy of your word, but, God, that they would receive it in their heart for, their, for themselves that they themselves would experience you, that they would fall in love with you, that they would desire for themselves a personal, intimate relationship with you. God, and that they would be obedient to what your word says and how to live. Father, I pray for each and every heart right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. There is nothing better, in my opinion, than hearing the story of how someone has come to faith in Christ. I love the story of a little boy who heard time and time again that Jesus died for his sins, and that if he trusted in him, he would be given eternal life. One day that boy was in the back seat of his car, in the back seat of a car, his parents were in the front seat, and while they parked in the parking lot, he got out of his seat and he poked his head over the front seat and said to his parents, tell me the story of Jesus again. They did, and 
After they finished, he ducked behind the seats. Right before the parents were ready to leave that parking lot, they told the little boy to get back in his seat, and he said, okay, but before I do, I have to tell you something first. They said, okay, uh, what do you need to tell us? I need to tell you what I did. What did you do? His mother asked, greatly troubled in her mind about what he might have done there in the floorboard of that back seat. I asked Jesus to forgive my sins and be my savior, the little boy replied. Smiles broke out on the faces of the parents, and after they got him home while putting him in bed, the little boy began to sing as he would almost every night of his life, go and tell the story of the Christ of Calvary. Go and tell the story of the Christ of Calvary. He will forgive your sins and he'll save your soul. He'll heal your heart and he'll make you whole. Go and tell the story of the Christ of Calvary. There is nothing better, in my opinion, than hearing the story of how someone has come to faith in Christ Jesus and how Jesus has changed their life. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do in your house church this morning. I want you to get your Bibles out and I want you to read in your Bibles Acts chapter 5, verses 16 through 42. Acts 5, 16 through 42. We're going to put a timer on the screen and you just hit pause and you read the verses out loud in your house church and then feel free to discuss the text. And if someone would like, if someone feels so led, if someone feels the courage, please feel free to share your story of how you came to faith in Christ. It might even be one of the children in your home today that wants to share how they came to faith in Jesus. Then after you're done reading and sharing, come back for some time together in the text as we explore Acts chapter 5 verses 16 through 42. I hope you're having an amazing time in your house church and reading the Word of God together, sharing what you're learning from the Word, and maybe even sharing a story of how you came to faith in Christ. I feel a little bit guilty interrupting, but I do want to go through this text with you. What a passage of Scripture we're in. Acts chapter 5, verses 16 through 42. The early church is growing. The Word of God is spreading from all over Jerusalem and all around the region of Jerusalem, and people are coming to Jerusalem from all over, and God is doing miraculous things through the apostles, and it is good, and things are great. That's verse 16, and then verse 17, except for a failed persecution of the leaders of the early church. This passage, verses 17 through 42, is framed by a failed persecution of the early church. The apostles are teaching the word of God and they're arrested. They're put in jail and overnight they're released by an angel. They're beaten and charged by the leaders of Jerusalem to cease preaching, to which they respond with rejoicing and preaching every day in the temple courts and from house to house. I think it's somewhat humorous as we take a look at this passage of scripture to look at the group that challenged the Sanhedrin, that challenged the apostles. Stop teaching. We told you once, now we're telling you again, stop. In verse 17, you look at their emotions and you see that they are filled with jealousy. There's just jealousy growing in their heart because the apostles are getting all the attention and people are paying attention to them. They're drawing the big crowds in the Sanhedrin. Nobody's paying attention to them anymore. Then after they notice that the apostles are missing, the Sanhedrin gets together and they're going to bring the apostles in from the jail cell and they're going to put them on trial and they're going to uh, do whatever they're going to do with them. And so they've gathered and they've got all their uh, ducks in a row, so to speak, and they send the temple guard out, go get the, go get the prisoners. And the temple guard goes to get the prisoners and they come back and like, uh, they're not there. The gates were locked, the guards were outside, but nobody's inside. And you look at Verse 24, and the, and the Sanhedrin moves from jealousy to they're just perplexed. I love this verse. It says, when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, that the apostles weren't there, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Can you just imagine the jealousy and now the frustration and the, the anger starting to boil inside of them? Where is this going to, how is this going to end? How did they get out? What in the world is going on? And then we see it takes a nameless, most likely positionless individual not a temple guard, not a member uh, of the Sanhedrin to come in and just say, hey, by the way, those people that you arrested last night, the apostles, they're right back in the temple in the same exact place where they were when you arrested them last night. Then later on in verse 33, we find the Sanhedrin is enraged, ready to kill the apostles. And then it takes a politically savvy member of the group, a man by the name of Gamaliel, which we will find out later in the book of Acts, became a mentor to the apostle Paul. But Gamaliel stands up and helps them bring things down a notch literally only a notch, because flogging, instead of wanting to kill the apostles, instead of killing them, they just flog them, and flog, flogging is truly just a notch below execution, as in flogging, sometimes people died. 
I think Luke is emphasizing the irritability and irrationality of the Sanhedrin, this jealousy that turns to perplex, that turns to uncertainty, that turns to anger, that turns to, we want to murder them because they had failed to maintain the order which, which they were charged to keep in all of Jerusalem. But what is the key to this passage? It's a great story. What is it in the center of this failed persecution and in the center uh, of the failure of the Sanhedrin that we need to look at? My friends, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is Peter and the apostles' bold declaration that the gospel is they will, they will be faithful to the gospel, that they must preach the gospel before the most hostile audience they have ever encountered. It is their refusal to remain silent in a world that says, shut up about Jesus. Can you imagine a world living in a world that says, shut up about Jesus? And the question really is this, what will be the price of their silence? What will it take to put an end to their preaching? But I think the real question for us today is, what is the price of your silence? What is it that keeps you from speaking up about Jesus and the life that you have in him? I want to spend the remainder of my time with you today looking at a phrase we find in verse 20. Verse 20 of Acts chapter 5 reads this way in the translation I'm using. Go, stand in the temple, and speak to the people all the words of this life. This is what the angel who comes and lets them out of prison in the middle of the night says. I want you to go back. I want you to take a stand. I want you to stand up in the temple where you were arrested. Go, go back to the exact spot where you were arrested and speak to all the people all the words of this life. I want to zero in on the phrase, this life. The translation I'm reading from says, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And the translation, my translation, the word life is capitalized, capital L-I-F-E. Many of the translations you're reading from just read uh, this life, uh, no capitalization. I believe that it's important that life in this instance should be capitalized. This phrase occurs only here in the scriptures, and so I don't want to get dogmatic about it, but here's what I think is going on. Things are happening so quickly. The church is growing so quickly. Miracles are happening so quickly. The early church and the leaders of the early church don't have any way to classify what do we call this? How do we explain it? How do we identify ourselves? They're not called Christians yet. That doesn't happen until later in the book of Acts. They're not called followers of the way yet. Again, that doesn't happen until later in the book of Acts. I think this night is the angel comes and releases them from prison and says, go back to the temple, stand and speak to the people all the words of this life. It's this sense of this is what's going on. This is about life. This is about life versus death. Pastor Woodward told us last week as he was taking us through the text that the scriptures teach that we have an enemy. Uh, the scripture refers to him as a thief in one way. It says, and the thief's job is to come to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus at the end of that passage says, but I have come so that you might have life, more and better life than you've ever imagined. Jesus on one occasion said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want us to understand what it is about the life, this life that the apostles wanted to speak about. I wish that we had recorded what they talked about in the temple that morning until they got arrested, but we don't. But they say enough about the life in this passage of Scripture and when they're standing in front of those who are trying to judge them, condemn them, and kill them, that we can understand some things about this life that God wants us to speak about. First of all, I want you to understand that this life is a gift. This is the gift of life. Friends, God gives life. Look at me, if you would, at verses 30 through 32 in Acts chapter 5. They say this. They're standing in front of those who've told them, do not preach, and you preach, and you fill Jerusalem with all of your teaching, so now we have to kill you. Peter says this, the God of our fathers raised Jesus whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Do you see that God gives life? The scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The first way God gives life is God gives, the, the only way God gives life is God gives life through Jesus Christ, the living word. God so loved us that he gave us life in the incarnate Jesus. One paraphrase of the scripture says that Jesus became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. He took on the form of a human being. God loved us so much that he gave us his only son. The scripture says that he is also the God, the God of our fathers who resurrected Jesus from the dead. God loved us so much that Jesus conquered death. This is a life conquering death kind of life. Jesus is the resurrected Savior. He also loved us so much, this passage of scripture says, that he gave us life and the ascended Jesus, that he exalted Jesus and gave him the position as leader and savior, the savior, the one who can forgive our sins, the leader, the one who can lead us to heaven, the only way to get there. And God loved us so much that he gave us life 
check this out, through repentance and the forgiveness of sin. I said he gave us repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Would you please note that so often when it comes to understanding Scripture, that we think repentance even is something that we do ourselves. We think that repentance, I've taught you for years, that repentance is like you're headed the wrong way down a one-way street, but you turn and you start going the other way. But we can't do that on our own. This was brought to my attention just a couple of weeks ago. Pastor Woldridge and I were out, and on this occasion I happened to be driving, and I'm getting ready to pull out of a parking lot, and the fastest way to get where we were going is to turn out of this parking lot and go left down the street. So I start to turn left, and my truck had gotten all the way out into the street when Pastor Woldridge kindly sitting in the passenger side, doesn't scream, doesn't yell at me. He's like, no, 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 I don't go, you can't go left, go right, you can only go right. I was about to turn the one way, wrong way down a one-way street, and I needed someone to point it out to me. Or I would have been headed not knowing I was going the wrong way. There was no oncoming traffic. I wouldn't have thought it was, thought it was dangerous. And that's how we live life. We just choose to go down a, a, a street the wrong way. And we don't see the potential danger. And we don't see it. And unless God gets our attention and calls us to repentance, it begins with him. Everything begins and ends with him. Even repentance. God is the giver of life. He gives us repentance and he gives us the forgiveness of sins. So this passage literally reads, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of life. So God gives life through Jesus Christ, the living word. But I want you to see this, this life. God breathes life into us on a daily basis through his written word. The Greek word translated here, go speak all the words of this life. The word translated words means a sound made by a living voice, a spoken word given by a living voice. It's commonly used in the New Testament for the Lord Jesus speaking his dynamic living word into a believer to birth faith. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His words give life. It reminds me of what Jesus said to the enemy that came to steal, kill, and destroy while tempting him in the wilderness. Uh, Jesus said to him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This life, this life that he wants us to talk about, this life that he wants us to have, it is a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Not only is it a gift, but I also want you to see about this life. I want you to see the guiding principle of this life. I need you to observe the principle in which the early church acted. It's expressed in one brief statement found in verse 29. We must obey God rather than men. That was the master principle of the early church, and it needs to be the master principle for everyone who chooses to receive the gift of life today. What I'd like to do for the next couple of minutes is I'd like to put the emphasis on those first four words. We must obey God. I want to look at every word, but I want to do it in reverse order. And so, first of all, we must obey God. Peter says, the God of our fathers, what he was telling them, people immediately understood that he was talking in front of them. This is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God who saw the misery of his people, who heard their cry and was concerned, and he sent them a rescuer and a redeemer. He is the deliverer. He is the one who hears our cry, who sees our misery. He knows our hearts, and he's concerned that we not stay in bondage. This is the God who raised Jesus from the dead, exalted Jesus to his right hand as leader and savior, and who gave repentance and forgiveness, and then who gives us the whole Holy Spirit just as he promised. Remember earlier in Acts we saw Jesus said, uh, uh, go back to Jerusalem and remain until the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. We must obey this God. He is God and he is the one true and the only true God. Next, we must obey. Not we must consider him or patronize him or hold theories concerning him or defend the fact of his existence. The word translated obey, it is obey, but it's a rare word occurring in the New Testament only four times. It stands exclusively for obedience. It does not suggest, suggest anything except actual, absolute, unquestioning submission. It is submission to a ruler, and there is only one ruler. And the only ruler is the one true God, the rescuer, the redeemer, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who sent Jesus to die on a cross, who raised him from the dead, who gave him the place at his right hand, who exalted him, and who has given us repentance and the forgiveness of sins and the power to live his life in the Holy Spirit. Next, we must... It's when a person or a group of people say, I must, or we must, that others really start to listen with respect. When a person says, I ought to, or maybe I should, we're not really interested. We're not moved. But a person, if they just know what they ought to do, they might never do it. But when someone says, or a group of people say, I must, or we must, and begins to interpret their rights and their beliefs in terms of obligation, then they are passing into the realm of power. It's only when we say, we must, Look at what these men did. All of these men are against you. We don't care. We must. You will be imprisoned. We don't care. We must. We are determined that you shall not. We must. We are ready to kill you. We don't care. We must. 
We must obey God. Let's look at the word we. They did not endeavor to persuade others to bear their responsibility, but they took the burden upon themselves. We. We're not going to pass the buck if this message of Jesus doesn't get proclaimed. It's not our fault. Somebody else should have done it. No, they said we are the sent ones. We are the ones who are told to proclaim Jesus. We are to be the ones that share. They didn't endeavor to persuade others to bear their responsibility. But I also want you to see with the word we, they did it together in community, every day, in temple courts, from house to house. They did it in community. I want you to say those four words together out loud in your house church. This is a gift of life, but this is the guiding principle of this life. We must obey God. Would you say them with me? We must obey God. Pastor Woldridge last week taught us the earlier part of this chapter and focused in on verse 14 that said, yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord crowds of both men and women. And he asked us if we really wanted this kind of revival and told us that it each told us each that it had to start in our own hearts. And I believe it starts with receiving this gift of life and then adopting this guiding principle of life. Whenever God's people say we must obey God and they mean it, they safeguard themselves against what one person has called the power of opposition, the peril of patronage, and the paralysis of compromise. I love those three words. If you look at those three words, it's to see some of the reasons why the church is not experiencing revival and has not recently produced the old effects that we see taking place here in the scriptures. If we really want revival, we must obey God. I don't know about you, but I'm almost ashamed to speak of suffering for Christ today in America. There's so little of it. When we see these men scarred, bruised, battered, carrying in their bodies the wounds of Jesus Christ, the actual brutal scars, the bruises, flogged almost to death, they have, they've been stoned and they have stripes on their back. When we put up, when we put that up against all that we suffer today, one is almost ashamed to speak of it as suffering. But opposition is still with us. It's insidious, it's smiling, it's devilish, it's opposition. And perhaps that kind of opposition is harder to fight than the other. How will we be safeguarded against yielding to all opposition? We must obey God. I believe the church's gravest danger has never been created by opposition. When the church has been opposed and persecuted, the church has been pure and strong and grown like never before. We see that in Acts and we see it throughout church history. However, when the church is patronized and admired by the world, when the church is looked to as a place of, of, of strength in the world today, that's when the church becomes weak. How can we safeguard against that? We must obey God. And so surely as the church needing to obey God, the church must also stand alone. The church must bear her testimony, opening her arms to receive the wounded so that they can be healed, spreading her arms to take on the wanderers back again and leading them to health and the blessedness life, to the blessed life that Jesus promises and reaching out to the foreigners among us, but never permitting the standards to be lowered or a message of righteousness to be silenced. Our claim on behalf of God to be his witnesses must never be reckoned of no account. In this story, we find not only the gift of life and the guiding principle of life, but I also want you to see the great purpose of life. This is revealed in the final words of Peter when he says, We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. The great purpose of life, would you say these three words with me? We are witnesses. Say them again, we are witnesses. We must obey God, we are witness. What is a witness? A witness is not a person who just merely talks. Many people will talk and they're not witnesses and many people will witness and not do any talking. The word for witness here is literally the word martyr. A martyr is a confessor who confesses not only with lip, but also with life. They're living the life that God, they share and show the love of Jesus in a powerful way. A martyr is an evidence, a credential, a demonstration of the power that God has given. I see Peter here standing in the midst of the intellectual aristocracy of Jerusalem, saying in effect, you have no right to question the accuracy of what we say until you have accounted for what we are. We are witnesses. You saw what we were. You saw that I was the first one to deny him three times. You saw what we were. I beg of you, see what we are now. And know that this change has been wrought because Jesus Christ was raised, to the, was raised and exalted by God the Father. He is our leader. He is our Savior. He gives us repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And he has given us the Spirit to live out his life in power. We received power. We're not what we were. This is what we are. We have followed him. We have repented. Our sins have been forgiven. We have the Spirit of God. And we are witnesses. The church is never powerful unless she can produce witnesses. 
not just students, not just learners, but witnesses. It's men and women listening to the teaching and the preaching and living life together in community, beginning to incarnate the thing that has been preached and living, becoming living witnesses, concrete, incarnate, incarnate documents. The way the church is supposed to find victory is through witnesses. It is the great purpose of life. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Look at that. In this passage of scripture, it says, we are witnesses and so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the church's power. This is the fact that we must grab, we grab, grab onto today. If we lack cooperation with the Holy Spirit, unless we are in business partnership with the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing to impress Jerusalem, Dayton, or the Miami Valley. Did you see what this leader of the Sanhedrin said? You have filled Jerusalem with his teaching. You filled Jerusalem and now it's overflowing and other people are coming in. And we cannot do that apart from the Holy Spirit. Peter couldn't have done it under his power. But when he was willing to submit and receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the apostles were able to live life according to this great purpose. Family, if we would fill the Miami Valley with the life of Jesus, we must be in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Then through joy and pain, the church will move forward with Christ Jesus in victory. There's nothing better, in my opinion, than hearing the story of how someone's come to faith in Christ and how Jesus changed their life. The story I told you earlier of the little boy in the back seat, that's my story. What's your life story? Every testimony speaks of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, telling these stories used to be commonplace in the community of faith, and I think we've forgotten that. I think we're embarrassed to tell our story. Maybe we don't know how. And we've forgotten how powerful this is. But when we receive the good news of Jesus Christ, it helps us understand who we are. That our identity cannot be earned and we cannot get there, but we are who we are simply because God loves us and he loved us enough. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. And when we receive the good news of Jesus Christ, it helps us understand who we are. But I believe the same thing happens when we share the good news of Jesus Christ. We define again who we are as followers of Christ. I believe we are in danger of forgetting that God calls us to move toward one another and toward our neighbors in love, that God has called us to share and show the love of Jesus right here where we start. We've been telling you, and Pastor Wardrews has been telling you that it's been our prayer, God, how would you have us uh, love and share Jesus right here in this valley? God, it needs to start in our hearts, move to our homes, and move into our neighborhoods. And it comes down very simply to this. Peter simply said, this is a gift of life. Will you receive it? This is the guiding principle of life. We must obey God. And this is the grand purpose of our life. We are witnesses of these things. This is the simple message of the gospel, life. This is the defining message of the life, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the exalting of Jesus as Lord and leader and savior and the repentance of sins and being given the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, there is opportunity for the church. Good things happen when we grasp this life. The disciples in this moment go on to take a flogging. Look at verses 41 and 42 with me. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, that the Christ is Jesus. They left rejoicing. That seems a bit odd, doesn't it? not if you're living this life. Some years ago, our church was raising money for what I would say were gospel purposes, including helping children who needed things like food and clothing and maybe some back to school supplies. And one of the children of the church, we asked the children of the church to take up an offering in, the, in their classrooms and talk to their moms and mom and dads. And many children brought back gifts. At that time, one girl was a fifth grade girl in our congregation and she told me about giving her gift and she said, Pastor Tim, when I gave this gift, I felt different. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She said, I felt different after giving something for Jesus, something for others to know about Jesus compared to the feeling I get after playing my video games. And then she said these words that I hope I never forget. She said, Pastor Tim, when you play a video game, you have nothing to show for it, nothing that will give you joy when you are dying. From a fifth grader. And these disciples walked away from a flogging. 
filled with joy because they were experiencing life. They were operating by a guiding principle. We must obey God. And they were fulfilling their grand purpose. Um, we are witnesses. And this gave them joy. It was worth dying for. And maybe that's a test for us, how we're investing our lives. Is this something that will give me joy when I'm dying? Sharing the gospel gives us joy. It also clarifies who we are. It's not, not only when we hear and receive the gospel that we know who we are as an individual and as a church, but it's also when we share the gospel. This passage is filled. And today, as you and your house church get ready to go to the Lord's table, this is what I want to encourage you to do. I want your house church leaders to have the freedom to do whatever they feel the Holy Spirit's doing in your midst. But I want to invite all of you to pass the bread and pass the cup and to hold the bread in one hand and the cup in the other hand at the same time before you take. And I want to ask you to ask yourself these questions. Have I received the gift of life? through repentance and the forgiveness of sins. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The scriptures say, if you confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, that he will somehow infuse this life into you through faith in Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ for life? Ask yourself, have I received this life through repentance and the forgiveness of sin? If the answer is no, I beg of you, Talk to your house church leader. Talk to somebody in your house church. Help them. Ask them to help you know how you can do that today. If you're listening alone, first of all, let me encourage you. Don't listen alone. Get involved in a house church. Get involved with a community of people. That's where you're going to grow the most. That's where life is. this life is going to be lived out. We, we is greater than me. Get involved in a house church. But if you are uh, struggling and you don't know, would you just send us an email at start at miamivalley.org, start at miamivalley.org, and one of your pastors will reach out to you and help you understand how you can receive this gift of life. If you don't want to wait, simply, if it is the desire of your heart, simply say, Jesus, I believe that you are who you said you are, that you lived the life of perfection, died a death on a cross, rose from the dead, and have been placed at God's right hand as leader and savior. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. I've been walking the wrong way down a one-way road. I see the danger. I'm turning and I'm going your way. So have you received this life? Secondly, I want to ask you as you hold the bread and the cup, is my life being governed by the guiding principle? Can you say we must obey God? Is there some area where God's calling you to obey, to completely surrender to who he is? We must obey. Is this your life's guiding principle? And then finally, is are you living your life according to the one great purpose? We are witnesses. Spend some time. If the answer to any of those questions is no, that can change today. We must obey God. We are witnesses. And then, before you take the meal together, however your house church leader wants to do that, I'd ask if someone in your house church might have the courage to share your story of receiving life in Jesus Christ. There's nothing better, in my opinion, than hearing the story of how someone has come to faith in Christ and how Jesus has changed their life, how they've received the gift of life, how they're operating life by the guiding principle that they are we are witnesses uh, that we must obey God and how they are living out the grand purpose being his witness where God has placed them starting in their heart and their home moving to their neighborhood father God as we go to your table we surrender we thank you that you are our rescuer you hear our cry you see our misery and you are concerned you sent Jesus you demonstrated your love for us, that you gave Jesus while we were still sinners. And just say, if you call out to me, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that I raised from the dead, you'll be saved. God, thank you that what we deserve is death, but your gift is life. Father, we receive this life. God, as we have this life, we want to use one guiding principle. God, we must obey you and you alone. We surrender to you, to your authority, to your leadership. And Father, we say we will be witnesses. We won't just wait. We are witnesses now. Willing to suffer, willing to do whatever you call us to do because that's why you placed us on planet Earth. Father, we love you. Bless everyone who hears. Give someone the courage in house church and outside of house church to share their story about how they receive the life that Jesus offers. In his name I pray, amen.